Okay, so this is the the third lecture, third online lecture, and so we're we're done with sort of the very brief introduction to probability theory that we saw in chapter seven, and now we're moving on to to the next chapter in the book. Uh, so, sort of broadly speaking, the next chapter sort of collects a variety of topics related to sort of additional, more more complex counting problems, and also the first part of chapter eight is. Uh, related to uh, certain quantities or sequences that that are solutions to things called recurrence relations, and so this is the the first topic we're gonna we're going to discuss. And basically, all of this lecture will just be about uh, recurrence relations, right? And so, what is a recurrence relation? Well, let's suppose we have a sequence of numbers, say a zero, a one, a two up to an, an plus one, and so on. So some infinite sequence of numbers. Uh, so the sequence is said to be defined by a recurrence relation if each element of the sequence, say an, is defined in terms of, of previous entries in the sequence, right? So maybe an is some combination of like an minus two times some number times an minus three and then plus an minus four or something like that. So that would be an example of, of a recurrence relation. Uh, and so sort of maybe a, a more simple example, which we're all familiar with, is the Fibonacci sequence, right? Because remember, in the Fibonacci sequence, each element of the sequence is determined by adding the two previous elements, right? So for example, three, we have a three in this position because I the last two entries in the sequence were one and two, and so I add those together to get the next entry, right? So this entry is determined by the two previous. And so this is a, a simple example of, of a recurrence relation. And so more precisely, let's say that, that I call capital Fn the nth term in this Fibonacci sequence. And let's suppose first that n is bigger than or equal to two. Uh, then we have the following formula for Fn, right? Fn is equal to Fn minus one plus Fn minus two, which is exactly a, a recurrence relation. Uh, however, notice that if I just gave you this formula, well, this is this is a great way to define the Fibonacci sequence, but you would run into an issue if you wanted to know like the first or second term, right? So from this formula, what is F zero, for example? Well, I have, F, if I plug in N equals zero here, I have two terms, F minus one and F minus two, which sort of don't make sense in this context. And similarly for F one, well, I would have F one is equal to F zero, which I don't know how to define, and then plus F minus one, which also sort of is not defined. Uh, and so in order to resolve this issue, you always have to assign certain initial conditions, right? You have to prescribe the value of where the sequence starts, right? So for the Fibonacci sequence, we, we wanted to start with F0 equal to zero and F1 equal to one uh, in order to actually sort of make sense of, of this recurrence, right? There has to be sort of one point where it starts or else it's sort of just like an abstract formula which doesn't sort of correspond to a, a, an actual sequence of numbers, uh, right? And so these, these conditions are usually called initial conditions, right? Because they need to, they sort of determine, given a recurrence, they determine a fixed sequence that solves the, that return, recurrence, which we'll see more of, uh, right? If you didn't have any initial conditions, you can still think about this recurrence in sort of an abstract way. And you can still talk about solutions, but you can never calculate solutions if you don't know the initial conditions. So this is the, the main point. Uh, right. And so, so we're going to sort of mathematically analyze uh, one particular case of, of a recurrence relation in, in pretty, uh, in, a, in, a lot of, in a lot of detail. But before I do that, I just want to give an example of sort of a, a famous problem where, where recurrence relations appear and where you can use the theory of, of recurrence relations to solve the problem. And so this is usually called the, the Tower of, of Hanoi problem. And it's some kind of puzzle, which I think a lot of people have probably seen in, in some form before. And so the, the ideas are the following. So you have, say, three different pegs or pillars set up, and you have some fixed collection, say, of n disks of different sizes. So for example, in this picture, we have four disks uh, ordered with uh, sort of in decreasing order with the largest on the bottom and the smallest on the top. And so the, the puzzle is the following. So suppose we're allowed to move the disks from one, uh, one at a time from one peg or from one pillar to another. Uh, but suppose we're only allowed to do this as long as we never place a disk 
on, on a disk, disk that's smaller, right? So at any point when you're moving when you're moving these disks, you're not allowed to put, say, for example, the green disk on top of the, the red disk. You can only put the red disk on top of the green disk, right? You have to maintain the sort of the order of, of the size. Uh, and so the goal of the puzzle is, under, with these sort of prescribed rules for how you can move the disks, the goal is to move all of the disks on the first pillar uh, either to the second pillar or the third pillar, right? So I want to take this whole stack and only using the moves that I've allowed in the description of the puzzle, I want to move this whole stack to the second pillar or to the third pillar. And that would be a solution to the puzzle. Uh, And so we can phrase this in terms of a, of a mathematical problem. So we can let, for example, h sub n denote the number of moves we need to solve this puzzle uh, with n starting disks. So for example, here n is equal to, in this picture, n is equal to four. And we would want to know, well, if we start with four disks, how many moves does it take to actually solve the puzzle? And so mathematically, the, that's the same as asking, well, what is hn as a function of n? Or equivalently, if I consider the sequence like H1, H2, H3, and so on, what, what is this sequence actually equal to? Uh, and so that's the problem that we'll solve using, using recurrence relations. Uh, so one thing to, to point out before I go into more detail, just looking at this picture over here, you can sort of, if you think about it for a few minutes, you can see how sort of there is some kind of recurrence structure. Uh, and in particular, let's consider the case N equals four that's in this picture. And so notice that if we, if we sort of look at the, the largest yellow disk on the bottom, let's just pretend that that wasn't there, right? So pretend that we can just erase this yellow disk. Well, then we're left with, with three disks, again, ordered in, in increasing size. And so we're left with a version of the problem when you only have three disks if you just pretend the, the yellow one isn't here. And so let's assume we know how to solve the problem when there are three disks. Well, then I can use exactly that number of moves, which is H3, to move the stack of blue, green, and red to pillar three, right? And so that takes, say, H sub three moves. Uh, well, then I can, I'm still left with the big yellow disc over here, but then I can just in one move, move the big yellow disc to pillar two, right? And so then I'll have the yellow disc on pillar two, and then the red, green, and blue stack in increasing order on pillar three. But then I can use again my information about how to solve the problem when there are three disks to move that whole stack from pillar three onto pillar two, and then I'll have solved the problem uh, using information about the problem from, from the case when n is smaller. Uh, and so what I've really described here, which we'll see now in, in more detail, is really some kind of recurrence structure. Uh, so let me go through this argument now in sort of a more, more abstract level. Uh, Right, and so the, the big idea, which we just looked at in when, when n is equal to four, is to solve the problem by writing it as a, as a recurrence relation. Uh, and so what we're gonna show is that if we know how to solve the problem when there are n minus one disks, then we can use that information to solve the problem when there are n disks, right? Before we had n equals four, and we sort of assumed we knew how to solve it when there were three. Uh, and so this works for general, general n. Uh, Right, and so, so we wanna begin with something that's not sort of vacuous. So we need some something which is essentially, if you think about induction, which is essentially like a base case. So let's suppose there was only one disk. Well, if there's only one disk, then certainly you can solve the problem in one step because you just move that disk to one of the other pillars. Uh, so H1 is, is definitely equal to one. And you want to think of this as sort of like a base case for, for induction. And there's a lot of similarities between sort of induction and, and recurrence relations and things like this. Uh, right. And so now let's suppose that we, we know how to solve the problem when there are n minus one disks and try to show how we can use that information to calculate hn. Right. So we're assuming we know the value of hn minus one and we want to use that to calculate hn. And so there's one sort of obvious way to do this, which is what I outlined in the case n equals four on the previous slide, right? So let's just pretend that the largest disk in the stack of n disks just isn't there. Uh, well, if the largest disk isn't there, you have n minus one remaining disks. And well, if we know, if we know how to solve the problem for n minus one disks, and we know the value of hn minus one, well, we can remove those n minus one disks to the third peg in, in exactly hn minus one steps using information about the problem for a smaller number of disks, right? Well, then the next step we're gonna do is move the nth largest disk, which is left alone on the first peg, and we'll move it to the second peg. Uh, 
And this only takes one step, right? Because I'm just moving it from one, one peg to another. So, so far we have HN minus one plus one steps. Uh, but now we're gonna be in a situation where, well, we have the one largest uh, disc on the second pillar, and then the remaining HN minus one, or sorry, the remaining N minus one discs, which are stacked in order of increasing size on the, on the third pillar. And so we have to remove the, the stack of N minus one discs from the third pillar back to the second pillar, which will take another HN minus one steps, right? So we're sort of solving the problem again, now moving from the third pillar to the second, but we're only moving N minus one, we're not moving all N, right? Again, we're sort of pretending the largest disc isn't there. Uh, but then what are we left with? Well, we're, we're left with a, uh, on the second pillar, we have all N discs stacked in increasing order, so we've solved the problem in this way. Right. And so right, so so I didn't I didn't animate the the uh it, it would have been I agree maybe it would have been nice if I included like an animation of, of the tower problem. But what I think would be a good exercise is to sort of go through this one step at a time and maybe draw some pictures when say n is equal to five to sort of help you sort of understand the, this argument a little better, uh, uh, right? So it's not so abstract. Uh, but if you sort of put everything, sort of con completing the argument, if we put all the information together that we've gathered, well, how many steps did it take to solve the problem? Well, it took, the first move we did took HN minus one steps because we were essentially solving the problem when there were, was one disk fewer. And then we had one more step to move the largest disk, which was remaining from the first to the second pillar and then finally, we we did, we had to apply H n minus one more steps to move the stack of n minus one disks from the third to the second pillar and and complete the solution. Right. So this is the total number of steps we needed to solve the problem with n disks in terms of of H n minus one. Right. And so if you gather this all together, what do we actually what have we actually proven sort of mathematically? Well, we've proven that that H n if I add those quantities together, Hn is equal to two times Hn minus one plus one. And so as I indicated at the beginning, this is a, a recurrence relation, right? I have my sequence, Hn is defined in terms of, of previous entries in the sequence. In this case, just the, the one right before it. Uh, right, and, and right, this is a, a recurrence relation. Uh, well, note that we, we already know the initial condition because we saw that when n is equal to one, uh, H1 is just equal to one. It's sort of the, the trivial case of the problem. And so while well, using this information, we can now just sort of starting when n is equal to two, we can just solve for the rest of, of Hn. Uh, for example, I can calculate H2 by taking two times H1 plus one. Well, since H1 is, is one, this is just two plus one, which is three. And so H2 is three. And now H3, well, H3 is gonna be two times H2, which is six plus one. So H3 is equal to seven. And now I can use H3 to solve for H4. I can use H4 to solve for H5 and, and so on, right? So using this recurrence relation and the initial condition, we can write down how, to so how many steps you need to solve this problem for any, any n, whatever n you want. Right, and, and so in order to sort of get a, a complete solution to the problem, you may want to actually determine a formula for Hn as a function of n. And using this, this recurrence relation, we can do that. Uh, and so such a formula is usually referred to as, sort of, as a, a solution to the recurrence relation, uh, say given this initial condition that H1 is equal to one. Right? So whenever you talk about a solution to the recurrence relation, it's some formula as a function of n that always solves the given relation. And so in this case, it's sort of not too hard to, to find a formula just without, without using any, any fancy methods, just sort of looking at it directly. And so the way you would sort of guess this formula is just sort of looking at the first few terms and guessing, well, it seems like Hn is, it's almost a power of two up to, up to a difference of one. So you would conjecture maybe Hn is two to the n minus one. Uh, and so let's, let's just prove this using, using the, form, the recurrence that we have. Uh, and so notice that if, if n is equal to one, then h of one, in this case, I have two to the one, which is two minus one. So I just wanna show h one is equal to one, which is something we already know. And so we know the base case of the induction. And so now for the induction step, let's fix k bigger than one uh, and try to determine, try to show that h k is equal to two to the k minus one using the, the induction step or the induction hypothesis. Uh, 
Uh, well, if we use the, the recurrence formula from up here, I know that HK is two times HK minus one plus one, which is something we proved independently, right? We're not using induction for this formula. This was proven on, on the previous slide. Uh, but now by induction, I can assume that HK minus one is equal to two to the K minus one minus one. So let me plug in that. So now I've plugged in the induction hypothesis over here. And now if I simplify this formula, I get two to the K minus one. And so this completes the, the induction step. So indeed, HK, assuming HK minus one is two to the K minus one minus one, we get the correct formula for HK. And so, so that completes the proof. Right, so we, we had this sort of uh, tower of, of Hanoi problem, which if you don't sort of look at it from this perspective using recurrence relations is actually a, a very complex problem to solve. Like if you just sort of try to randomly like pick up the disks and move them around. But if we, we take this perspective, we can sort of get sort of a, a pretty concrete understanding of, of everything, at least mathematically related, related to this problem. So this is one, one application of, of recurrence relation. Okay, and so, so the next thing I wanna talk about now that we've looked at a specific example of where these things show up is more like the, the mathematical theory of, of finding solutions to recurrence relations. And so we're only gonna be looking at one very specific case, which are uh, recurrence relations, which are called linear uh, because they have some kind of, of linear structure. Uh, so this word is appearing, if, if you know a little bit about linear algebra, it's linear in the sense of, of linear algebra. Uh, if you don't know linear algebra, that's, that's perfectly fine since it's not a pre prerequisite for the class. Uh, right, so let's sort of look at, 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 at some examples of, of these types of, of relations. And so the, the general problem is the following. So let's suppose I have a sequence, say a sub n. And suppose the sequence is given to me by a, a recurrence relation that has this form, right? So a n is determined by some constant c1 times a n minus one plus some other constant times uh, a n minus two. And so these constants c1 and c2 are fixed and don't depend on n, but, but of course a n minus one and a n minus two do depend on n and they're sort of previous entries in, in the sequence. Uh, and let's also suppose that we have these two initial conditions which are given to us. So we know that A0 is some number A and A1 is some number B, right? Right, sorry, sorry. Uh, I think I just had a, a drop in the internet, so. Uh, right, okay, sorry about that. Right, so we, we're looking at the, this linear recurrence relation uh, with these given an, an initial conditions, right? And so what we wanna talk about is, well, well, given all this information, sort of abstractly, how do I solve this problem, right? How do I find a solution to this recurrence if C1, C2, A, and B are all fixed, uh, real numbers? And of course, the solution a n is going to be a sequence. So a sequence is the same thing as a function of, of n, where n varies over, over natural numbers. Okay. Right, and so, so again, so like, a, like a, a lot of things in, in math, the best way to understand sort of the abstract theory is to begin by trying to understand specific examples. Uh, so let's, let's suppose I have this recurrence relation where a n is equal to a n minus 1 plus 2 times a n minus 2. And let's suppose the initial conditions are, say, a0 is equal to 2 and a1 is equal to, to 7. And so let's just sort of attempt to guess a solution. So this will be sort of an attempt, and then I'll go through the more rigorous way to, to solve it. Uh, and well, if, if we go back to the, the Tower of Hanoi example, remember that was, uh, the solution to that was given by some kind of exponential function in n, right? I had 2 to the n and then plus some constant. Uh, so let's just try to sort of guess that maybe maybe my solution is some kind of exponential function that looks like this, where r is some real number and alpha one, this is, so this is the Greek letter alpha sub one, alpha one is just some other real number. Uh, so notice we, we can assume that, that alpha one and r are both not zero, because if these were zero, then, then an would have to be zero for every n, 
Uh, but we know in particular that it's not because these initial conditions are not zero, right? So I can assume both these numbers are not zero. So this is not like a vacuous or, or trivial thing. Uh, right, and again, you want to, why are we working with exponentials? Well, the intuition is compared to what we saw in the, the, the Tower of Hanoi example, we got an exponential. So you would guess maybe maybe they're always exponentials. Uh, although, sure, that's not a rigorous proof, but we'll we'll give a more rigorous proof later. Right, and so I just sort of copied again the, the problem we're, we're working with and, and our, our guess. And so now let's just plug in this guess into the recurrence relation. So I'm gonna plug in alpha one r to the n for a n, and then alpha one r to the n minus one for a n minus one, and then alpha one r n to the minus two for a n minus two. And so that gives us the following equation. And we'll notice if I, if I rearrange this equation, and bring the terms on the right-hand side to the left-hand side, and then I factor out r to the n minus two, uh, I'm left with this expression. Uh, well, notice we're assuming that alpha one and r are not zero, right? And so therefore, if r is a solution to this equation, r squared minus r minus two is zero, then we have a, a solution to the, the recurrence relation, right? Uh, because if I just sort of assume that this term is zero and then I rewind the steps, well, then we see that a n defined in this way is a solution. Uh, right? And so in particular, we, we have a solution whenever this number r that we fix is a root of this polynomial r squared minus r minus two. Uh, this polynomial is usually called the, the characteristic polynomial of the equation, uh, r squared minus r minus two. Well, notice if you remember from algebra, this is a quadratic polynomial. So a, a quadratic polynomial can have potentially two roots. If it doesn't have two roots, then either it has no roots over real numbers or it has a repeated root. Uh, so in this case, the polynomial we're working with, you can check by using the quadratic formula or just factoring it directly that this polynomial has two distinct roots. And so either one of those roots will work. So we could have taken R up here to be either of the roots of this polynomial. Right, and so this is sort of just sort of like a, a guess and basic analysis. And now let's try to look at this a little bit more, more precisely. And so what have we learned? Well, to solve the, the recurrence relation that we're working with, we, we look at the characteristic polynomial, which is obtained by, right, so remember that the coefficient of R is the negative of the coefficient of AN minus one. And then this number minus two is the negative of the coefficient of, of AN minus two. And I want to find roots of this polynomial, or I want to solve this equation, r squared minus r minus 2 is equal to 0. And so if you factor the polynomial or use the quadratic formula, the, the two roots are, are r1 equals 2 and r2 equals minus 1. Uh, right, and so, so using either of these for, for my value of r will give me a, a solution, uh, as we saw on the previous slide. And so actually we, we know a little bit more. And so it turns out that if you have, let's say I have two distinct solutions to this recurrence relation, say a n and b n. Well, it turns out that if I have two solutions, a n and b n, and I add them together, say a n plus b n, then that gives you another, another solution to the recurrence. Uh, and similarly, if I have a solution a n and I just multiply it by a fixed constant, say I may multiply a n times five, uh, well, that, that will correspond to multiplying, uh, right, so I multiply the whole sequence by five, then I also end up multiplying these terms by five, and so those will cancel out, and so I get another solution uh, if I multiply a given solution by another, by another constant number. Uh, and so if you know, say, two solutions, you can construct a third solution by adding together any combination of these solutions, right? Uh, and so what I, what I would recommend doing, I, I chose not to, to include the, the, these details on the slides, but what I would recommend doing is maybe pausing the lecture and actually checking this for yourself. So suppose you have one solution a sub n to this relation and another solution b sub n to the same relation and show that if you add them together, you get a third solution. Uh, it's a, a good exercise to, to check if you wanna do that now. But assuming that this actually works, well, I can combine the two solutions I get from these two roots, from R1 and R2, and I can get sort of a more general solution by taking some number alpha one times R1 to the power of n, and then adding on some other number alpha two times R2 to the power of n, right? So each individual term here we saw on the previous slide is a solution, 
And then if you add these together, you get a more general solution. Uh, right, and then plugging in for, for R1 and R2, I get alpha 1 times 2 to the n plus alpha 2 times minus 1 to the n as a solution. Uh, and so, well, well, we're not completely done because the question is, well, what, what is this number alpha 1 and what is this number alpha 2? Uh, but notice up, up until this point, we haven't used any, any information about the initial conditions over here. Right, and so now we're going to use the initial conditions to determine exactly what alpha one and alpha two are. Right, right. and so for example, I know that a zero is equal to one, so that means when I plug in zero for n, I have one over here, and then I have to replace n by zero, and so that would give me one. Well, the exponential term is just anything raised to the power of zero is one, so I get one is equal to alpha one plus alpha two. On the other hand, if I plug in n equals one. Well, I'm told that a1 is equal to 7. So on the left-hand side, I have 7. And then on the right-hand side, I have 2 to the power 1 times alpha 1, which is 2 alpha 1, and then plus alpha 2 times minus 1 to the power 1, which is negative alpha 2. Right? And well, what can I do now? Well, I have two unknowns, alpha 1 and alpha 2, and I have two linear equations in these unknowns. And so you can always solve, solve these equations uh, or you, if there is a solution, you can always solve them. And so in this case, we can see that there is indeed a solution and you can check that alpha one equals three and alpha two equals minus one give solutions. Uh, right, and so our, our final answer is, this is the, the a solution to the recurrence relation. Uh, if I plug in three for alpha one and, and minus one for alpha two. And so you may ask, well, okay, you maybe you believe me that, that this a sub n is a solution, but how do we know that there's sort of not like a more complicated sequence that is also a solution, right? We haven't shown that this is the only solution. I just showed that it is a particular example of a solution. Uh, well, it turns out, which we'll see in the next theorem, that actually this is the only solution to the problem. So we found the, the one solution, uh, right? So, so this is what we'll, we'll talk about now. And so, right, so the general theorem is, let's suppose we're trying to solve a recurrence relation of the type considered above. Uh, this theorem tells us exactly how, how to solve it, right? So we have the recurrence a sub n is equal to c1 a n minus one plus c2 a n minus two. We have a sequence a n which is determined by this recurrence relation. And so what you do in order to solve this relation is, well, you form this characteristic polynomial where the coefficient of R and then the, the constant term in the polynomial are determined by C1 and C2 from the recurrence relation. And so let's suppose that this polynomial has two distinct roots, R1 and R2, as in the last example. Uh, then the theorem is that, that all solutions are of the form uh, some constant times the first root to the power n plus some other constant times the second root to the power n. Uh, and so what are these alpha one and alpha two? Well, these will depend on, on whatever the initial conditions are which are given to you, uh, but sort of the abstract form of the solution is always this, uh, when you have two distinct roots. Right. And so I'll, I'll prove this theorem on, on the next slide, but maybe before I prove it, let's just go back to a, a, an example that we're, we're familiar with. Uh, well, remember that the, the Fibonacci sequence, we had the following recurrence. So a n is equal to a n minus one plus a n minus two. And the initial conditions are a sub zero is zero and a sub one is equal to one. Right? And so I'm, I'm sort of leaving out the details from the slide, although you can find them in the book. But if I, if I write down the characteristic polynomial for this relation, and then I find the roots and then solve for alpha one and alpha two in this case, you get the following formula uh, for the nth Fibonacci number. Right, so in this case, a sub n is a solution to this recurrence relation with these initial conditions, meaning a sub n is exactly the nth Fibonacci number. And if I use this theorem, sorry, my, my, my internet keeps skipping out and I'm not sure if it's, it's recording or not. Right, okay, so, so we, we see that the nth Fibonacci number using this theorem you can calculate is equal to this expression uh, involving uh, sort of surprisingly the square root of five. Uh, so if you're familiar with something called the golden ratio, that's this number that's appearing over here. Uh, although the, so the, the nth Fibonacci number is given by some sort of exponential quantity involving the, the golden ratio. And so in particular, you can use this formula 
in your computer to just calculate, write down a very quick algorithm to calculate the nth Fibonacci number that solves, that calculates the nth Fibonacci number in, in n steps or O of n steps uh, and does not need to store the previous values in order to do this. Right? Uh, Okay, and so, right, so how are we gonna prove this theorem? Uh, well, remember, we're trying to understand solutions to, to this recurrence relation where C1 and C2 are fixed, and then our sequence is, is AN. Uh, well, we've actually already proved one part of the theorem. We proved that if I have these two distinct roots and I take some combination of them in this way and I let AN be this combination, then that is a solution to the recurrence. I mean, so I didn't write out the proof in, in full abstraction like, like this, but if you just return to the previous example and use the same argument from the example we looked at before the theorem, you'll see that, that this is always a solution. Uh, so what do we actually need to prove? We need to prove that these are the only solutions, right? And so in particular, we need to show that if we have any other solution to the recurrence relation, then it has to be of this form, right? It has to be some combination of R1 to the N plus R2 to the N. Uh, possibly multiplied by by some constants, right? And so let's do that. So let's suppose that that B sub n is another solution, and let's suppose we're given the following initial conditions: say B sub zero is capital B zero, and B sub one is capital B one. And so we want to show that that using this information, that B sub n has to be of this form, right? It has to be some combination of the two roots, each raised to the power n. Uh, and so this this may seem sort of like a, a daunting problem. Like, how am I going to just use abstractly like a, an abstract sequence? How am I going to show that it actually has to equal uh, this qu a quantity like this? Uh, and in general, this is sort of a hard problem uh, to deal with in sort of like more abstraction. But the thing that will help us here is that notice that any any sort of solution to the recurrence relation up here is completely determined by the initial conditions, right? For example, if I know what B0 and B1 are, and I assume that Bn is a solution to this recurrence, well then B2 has to be equal to C1 times B1 plus C2 times B0. And so B0 and B, B1, which are the initial conditions, determine B2, right? Well, and then once I know B2, I can use B1 and B2 to determine B3. Once I know B3, I can use, uh, B3 and B2 to determine B4 and, and so on. And so just sort of continuing this on, right, you can see that, that once you fix the initial conditions, it, it uniquely determines what the solution has to be. Uh, and so we, for, the, for this B sub n, we, we fix the two initial conditions to be capital B0 and capital B1. Uh, well, now let's compare the solution Bn to the solution An, which is a combination of, of nth powers of these roots. Well, what are the initial conditions of, of An? Well, A0 is equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2, and A1 is equal to alpha 1 R1 plus alpha 2 R2, where remember R1 and R2 are just roots to this polynomial that have been fixed at the beginning. It, they depend on C1 and C2 in some way, uh, but C1 and C2 are fixed. Uh, so what do we have to do? We have to show that I can always find alpha 1 and alpha 2 such that, well, alpha one plus alpha two is equal to B zero, right? The A, the, when N is equal to zero, the initial condition is the same. And also when N is equal to one, the initial conditions are the same, uh, right? Why does this suffice? Because then this shows that, that if I can solve these two equations, then my sequence BN has to have the same initial conditions as my sequence AN. But if these two solutions to the recurrence have the same initial conditions, they have to be the same sequence, which is what we just, argued uh, over here in the middle of the slide we just argued, right? So it suffices to show that I can, given B0 and B1, and with R1 and R2 fixed, I can always find alpha 1 and alpha 2, which solve these equations, uh, as long as R1 does not equal R2. And so it turns out that you can always do this when R1 and R2 are not equal. Uh, you basically have two linear equations and two variables, and there's a criteria for when you can solve these that's related to, to the assumption that R1 is not equal to R2. And so if you, you just sort of maybe pause the, the lecture and, and write out the algebra, you can, you can show that these indeed can be solved uh, under this assumption. And so that, that essentially proves, proves the theorem, right? Because now this shows that, 
I can pick alpha one and alpha two. So B zero is, is alpha one plus alpha two. And also B one is alpha one R one plus alpha two R two. And so therefore my, my sequence BN has the same initial conditions as this sequence over here. And therefore, since they both solve the recurrence, they have to be the same, the same sequence. Right, and, and so I just wanted to add a, a brief remark. If you are familiar with linear algebra, there's, it's sort of relatively easy to see why, why you can always solve these, these equations. Uh, if you haven't taken a course in linear algebra, you can just ignore the, the next 30 seconds. Of course, it's not a prerequisite, so I won't be like, requiring you to do any linear algebra in, in exercises or, or exams or things like this. Uh, right, but remember, right, so assuming R1 is not equal to R2, the, the problem we ran into at the end of the last proof is we want to always we want to find a solution to this system of two equations where alpha one and alpha two are my unknowns, uh, b zero, b one, r one, and r two are all fixed. Well, I can rewrite this as a as a matrix equation uh, of the following form, and right so this vector b of b one and b zero and b one is fixed, and then also I know everything in in the matrix. Right, these are the first two entries are just one, and the second two entries are are the two roots. And so what I want to do is really show that I, I have alpha one, alpha two that solve this, this matrix equation. Uh, but you can check that, that this matrix is invertible exactly when, when R1 is not equal to R2. Because if you take the determinant of this matrix, that's just R2 minus R1. And so the determinant is non-zero exactly when R1 is not equal to R2. And in this case, you can always find alpha one and alpha two by applying the inverse matrix to B0, B1. Uh, if you haven't taken a course in linear algebra and you have no idea what I was just talking about, that's that's okay too. I just wanted to indicate if you're familiar with linear algebra, the, these techniques are useful for solving uh, recurrence problems. Right. Okay, and then then finally, well, remember if we if we go back to this this general theorem, uh, this theorem only works when you have two distinct roots. Uh, so this played a crucial role, and in particular, if you don't have two distinct roots. Then, then this condition fails, and I may not be able to I may not be able to solve these equations for alpha one and alpha two. And so, really, the argument we just gave only works when the roots are distinct. And so, well, what happens if you you have a recurrence and the characteristic polynomial has one repeated root? Right. Well, in terms of algebra, what does it mean that this polynomial has a repeated root? It means I can factor it in the following way. I can write my, my characteristic polynomial as r minus some, some r sub zero squared. Right? So it factors as, a, as the, the square of a, of a fixed linear, linear polynomial. Okay. And so what, what I just want to briefly talk about to end the lecture is, well, in this situation, how, how do you solve the, the recurrence? Right. And so what is the, the analog of the theorem we just looked at in the case of repeated roots? Right. And so, right, so the theorem changes, although it does look, look pretty similar. So let's consider again the same recurrence where I have a n is c1 times a to the n minus 1 plus c2 times a n minus 2. And so let's suppose that in this scenario, the characteristic polynomial only has one repeated root, r sub 0. Uh, then it turns out that all solutions, the solutions are still almost given by exponentials, but they're just a little bit more complicated. So all solutions are of the following form. The first term is just like what we saw before. I have some number alpha one times the root to the power n. And then in the second term, I have some number alpha two, and then I have the number n times the root to the power n. So this is sort of the key difference is this term is, is n times an exponential of n uh, in terms of the root. And as before, the particular values of, of alpha one and alpha two will depend on, on whatever initial conditions are, are given to you. Right, and so, so I'm not gonna go through the, the full proof in detail, although the, the argument is very similar to the proof we gave uh, from the last theorem. But one thing I do wanna mention is, well, let's suppose we said alpha one equals zero and just consider this, uh, say, n times r zero to the n. So why is it the case that, that this sequence is a solution to the original recurrence? Uh, it's actually not, not, a, not a trivial problem to check that this is a solution. Like you have to, there's a, there's a bit of a trick involved to actually show that it solves the recurrence. And so the trick is the following. Uh, well, notice that, that since I'm assuming R sub zero is a repeated root 
for my, my characteristic polynomial, that means I can factor the polynomial, as we saw on the last slide, as r minus r sub 0 squared. But now let me expand out this, this quadratic term over here. If I expand this out, I see that my original polynomial is equal to, to the polynomial r squared minus 2r0 times r, and then minus the negative of r0 squared, right, just by, by multiplying this all out. But, but then these, these two polynomials, which are functions of r, are equal. Well, if two polynomials are equal, their coefficients have to be the same. And so therefore, c1 has to be twice r sub 0, and c2 has to be negative r0 squared. And so if you use these two pieces of information and you plug in a n to the recurrence, you can check that, that it is indeed a, a solution. And so I, I would recommend doing that yourself as an exercise. Uh, Again, because sure, I can write out the solution on the slides, but it, you'll learn more if you just sort of do it by hand. Uh, I've give, uh, given you hopefully enough information to, to check that. Uh, and then once you know that, that, that in this case you have a solution, the proof of the theorem is, is very similar to the proof we saw previously, so I won't, I won't go into detail about that either. Uh, okay, and so that, that pretty much ends what I want to, to talk about related to, to recurrence relations. So this has been sort of just very, very brief overview. Uh, and so in terms of like the technical terminology, we've only studied recurrence relations, which are linear, meaning there's some, all the terms here are, are linear terms. And also th this is a homogeneous example, meaning there's no like constant term to the right over here. Uh, so if you go into the textbook, the, the textbook spends a lot more time on, on, on other cases where, for example, you have some constant term here, which is like the non-homogeneous case. Uh, you can also consider the case where maybe a n doesn't just depend on a n minus 1 and a n minus 2, but also a n minus 3 and a n minus 4 and so on. And so in that case, you're not going to have a quadratic polynomial, but you'll have a polynomial of, of larger degree. Uh, but the, the theorem generalizes and it looks very, very similar. And so if you're interested in sort of more complicated recurrence relations, there's a little bit more information in the, in the textbook. Uh, but this is just sort of like a, a, a basic introduction to how the, these things are solved. Uh, all right. And so for the, for the next lecture, we're going to move on to more counting problems and we're going to talk about a generalized version of inclusion-exclusion. And so we'll pick up with that after the exam next week.